My name is Tracy Allen Bridal. I was born in 1963 in Southampton and um, I come from a background of a Roman Catholic mother and a father who's Protestant. And uh, I grew up with a parents that were both, one was different than the other. My mother was quite religious because she came from a Mediterranean background with her father, my granddad. He was uh, Maltese from the, from the Mediterranean. Obviously, he followed the um, religion of, of, of Catholic because he was a Roman Catholic being Maltese. So the Pope and people like that were very important to him. And obviously the prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, um, was always displayed in his front room like it is my mother's bedroom. So that I was always reminded of that. And my mum would also tell me stories. And um, my father, however, we were chalk and cheese. My dad is, don't believe in this, don't believe in that. He came from a hard family pre-war two wars, in fact. So my dad was typical, I call stereo Brit, that hasn't got time for anyone else, uh, only his family. He never harms a fly, great man, but he has different opinions than me and other people. Um, so I, I always had religion in the background and it was always in my heart, you know, because it was basically put into me by my mother, if anybody. And of course, as a young man growing up, from a toddler through to my teens, I then stumbled upon, uh, football was my, still my passion now, soccer. And we, you know, coming with a friend going to Boys Brigade, didn't know what that was about. So I went to a, a system of becoming, not a scout, but a Boys Brigade. And they would do church there and talk about, you know, religion. Because even back then in the um, late 60s, early 70s, uh, of course, you, you know, you have friends and people at school and that's where it starts. You have the school prayers in my day, and I'm sounding like an old man now, and, uh, but in my day in school, the normal process was to assembly, sit down regardless of what religion you were, and we sit down in the hall in our hundreds, and the teachers would start off with the usual prayer, and also the songs, the Christian songs, and it was a normal thing, you know, and they would talk about God for about, you know, half an hour before you went to your lesson. So, in a way, everybody was um, being taught about Christianity and being told about God. In the 70s, I then went to secondary school, Wollstone, comprehensive, and that was a, a big wake-up call because we're obviously at puberty now and boys are boys and things started changing. I had a unique circle of friends. Um, and when I say unique, is purely because um, a lot of my friends were f foreign culture, whether they had a Jamaican influence, Pakistani influence, and of course British, but um, it didn't wash with everybody, so to speak. A lot of the, um, a lot of people, you know, were, you shouldn't be hanging around with that person because they're this culture, and you get the usual jibes, if not my name in a the class, there'd be poor kids in the classroom of friends of mine be picked on because of their faith because of their culture. And I don't see colour, see? And I believe all the colours come into one, just like the rainbow, you know? So I was popular to a lot of people, but, but not the, the wrong people, if, if that makes sense. Going on from when I left school, I was big in the music scene, and um, when the mime artists suddenly appear into the music, even the most racial people, I could see that it was breaking boundaries to captivate them on the streets, and I was into the busking. So I got a big reputation with people that I danced with, and we became an act, only small. Went to London, got picked up to go on this program or um, you know, a local show, whatever it might have been. So I was popular because of the dancing and um, I never had a clue what was gonna come years later. And obviously when it came to the early 80s, I'm a young man in relationships, uh, or one relationship in particular. Went for a bad relationship way back then with a girl and I was at, you know, really devastated with a breakup with a girlfriend back then. And it was, the new door was opening for a new journey. And the new journey was, uh, I joined the British forces, the army. My uncle, who was a big influence in my life, Uncle Paul, he was a tough Liverpudlian, and I mean the toughest man I ever knew. He was, a, he was a young man that left home at 13, 14 from Liverpool during the bad times and joined the Viking ships and became a Norwegian, basically. And he was a tough character, a tough cookie, but he was a very knowledgeable man and had so much respect for culture. 
and socialism, I suppose, in lots of ways, Russians in particular, how other people lived. But he said to me, he was ex-territorial, and he was like, you're joining the army, sort yourself out, son. That'll knock you into shape. Then what about girls? That'll knock you into shape. And I listened to him, and I proceeded to um, enroll for the army, which was probably one of the biggest tests of my life, to become a soldier, where so many people applied, about 700, with of us not realising that the pass hour rate was going to be about between 70 uh, to 100. And uh, I remember on the parade square when people's names were being called out proud in front of our families. Um, and people were like, going, oh, wife from in private so and so going to Hong Kong and America, Kenya. And then they shout out, wife from in bridal is going to Ulster. And I'm looking at my parents in the crowd in my uniform and my rifle. And people were like, sad, unlucky. And then I realised. What they were talking about was Northern Ireland. It was part of a soldier's job, and I got a pretty bad deal with my postings. And uh, it was certainly a wake-up call, and it was a new life for me to embark on. And uh, lots of bad times as well as good times, but the bad times out outweighed the good times, especially with a lot of the bombing campaigns that we are unfortunately involved with. Um, many, too many to name, and, and, and things that are happening to our regiment, but particularly people dying and that and uh, the worst bit obviously for me was the involvement of the Inniskillen bombing and then that obviously showed to me and proved to me that terrorism was between white versus white you know and uh, over religion which really took me away from the religious aspect I then hated religion and to a certain degree I'll be honest to you at that time God wasn't one of my best friends why would he let you know Catholic and Protestant fight it was, you know, and I was, things like that just tore my heart to pieces. And I was thinking as a young soldier, and I know a lot of soldiers probably in the British Army and American be watching this now thinking, why are you talking about this? Well, the truth is when, you know, you don't realise what, you know, what you're joining. Some people do, they, they look forward to that, especially in today's world because they see propaganda. But at that time I was thinking, what am I doing? Fellow man and brother, you know, what's this all about over religion? over politics and really what it's all over about and this is what the world's having a problem with is territory who owns what when i did my time served and come out from the forces from the army because i still had time to go back if i wanted they gave you a, a year to think about things and then some people do go back they can't handle civilian life so civilian life was a terrible effect on me because it wasn't the same and even friends have said that I was different and family and, and some people didn't like what they saw uh, a lot of my heart was ripped out of me I resented God uh, because of things that I was uh, you know I witnessed at that time so I was rebellious and I I suppose in some respects in, in a big scale I renounced God and I just went about my day-to-day -day basis trying you know to do my best and then of course I got into a relationship with a with a girl got into a, quite a wild relationship and um, ended up as a result of that relationship I had two beautiful special boys twins that were um, a miracle in themselves because of that relationship and I had to as responsibilities of a father I um, it, you know I had to try and provide for them and her because we got married after a couple of years which didn't last long really to be honest with you and so i got into another relationship although i wasn't looking for one with a with a, with a lady I fell in love with her and she came to live with me we had a son who i now haven't seen for 11 years properly although i saw him before christmas for the first time which is a pain in my heart um he's 13 now so my belief and trust in ladies particularly at that time after two failed was really you know well that's it now i've learned by this got children and I'm just going to sort of like make it on my own in my life and um, of course you don't see what's ahead of you, you know, Allah always has something ahead of you. I was a DJ at the time, very popular in the areas and um, I was at a family, a friend's function of his daughter's engagement party and I had a pull on my top from which then became my next relationship which I didn't look at it as a relationship I thought it was just going to be a girl took interest in me she pulled my top and said hello introduced herself and we ended up going out with one another and um, not realizing that this poor girl at the time 
had severe issues in her life, bless her heart, and a lot of mental health issues because of family abuse and things. And I fell in love with her and became her helper. And throughout that relationship, it then started going off and on. And I started thinking, well, wait a minute, it's got to be me, because this is the third time now. So I started blaming myself. And even though people say, no, 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 we know, you know, we know this girl, we, we, we can see that she's not right, bless her heart. And we, had, we ended up having a baby. And this is where little Archie made his entrance and came about. And one day, uh, I come home from, from work during the afternoon. I had a funny feeling, and I didn't know where this feeling was coming from, something was wrong. And I knew, because I left in the morning when she was all over the place. And I was worried about my little boy, but I come home and the police were outside with about four or five vans. And I thought, oh crikey, what's going on here? Because there was an incident before that, and uh, I thought it was something to do with that. And I got wrongfully arrested and taken away humiliatingly. You know, they humiliated me like an animal. And they took me away, didn't even tell me why. And they took me away to a police cell, because at that time as well, I was a jailer. So ironically, I was a court service jailer. And the people, that's why they took me further out of the area, to where the people didn't really know of me, but they did. And I was taken into the police cells, thinking my baby's at home and blah, 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 we're gonna get you a solicitor. I'm like, what for? And by the time they took me to court, uh, the judge and her wisdom, because I was ill, um, the female magistrate came down to the cells, so I'm told, and I know this, because you know, she said this man wasn't uh, well enough to attend court as too late as six o'clock at night on a Friday night. We're going to remand him in prison while um, we get prepared for the court case next week. And somehow they lost my paperwork when I was up in prison, taken up, ironically, up to Bicester, and I was remanded up in prison. Uh, it was supposed to be a long weekend, but it was about a week, a week and a bit. And by the time they brought me back to Southampton, this is where my journey started towards God, because they brought me to court and I was a shadow of what you see now. Total wreck. And uh, from what I know, for people that attended, there's a lady who was a, um, an independent um, representation to help me. She saw something in me that she knew something wasn't quite right. And um, the magistrates there and then, a week later, then said the court case wasn't ready. We're going to have to bail him but he's not allowed to come back into Hampshire. So they sent me out on the streets homeless. I'm over, I believe now, it was somewhere like Yeovil, Ilchester, ended up down at Glastonbury, not with the druggies, but they were with me, but you know, those sort of areas, Bristol, homeless. And a couple came looking for me and heard on the grapevine who from my place in Southampton, his wife did, she cared a lot about me. And they drove the car and the van to where I was in Yeovil, and they gave me the van. And as far as I'm aware, from what I've been told, I used to drive all the, I'll say nutters, and uh, not realizing that I'd had a breakdown. And I was in a psychiatric hospital, not sectioned, but I had a breakdown, bang. So basically just to, you know, Give you an ending to this, what happened was, I mean, um, my partner was advised to by another girl who was going through the same thing, but this girl was having a problem with her fella, and she advised my partner then to um, say these things and allege things so she could get a management move, what's called a management move in Britain, and um, unbeknown to me, and that happened, and that's where I ended up, you know, she got a management move, and I, the council and everybody took my apartment away from me, my rights for over 10 years or whatever it was at the time. But the court, when they brought it to court, it, it didn't even go any further. They looked into it properly in the case and then they realised there was no case. They knew that she, she, in a way, admitted as well that it was exaggerated, you know, and they realised that she had problems and, that, and it was under the doctors and they just quashed the court case and said, this man suffered enough. But by then it was too late because I had no property. I was at death's door with, you know, with suicide, things like that, and, I, and that's how I ended up in the hospital. During that time in the hospital, however, when I wasn't really au fait who I was, you know, and when this court case was going on, um, which I know now, and I have to be thankful to this young, uh, this woman, uh, an ex-love came, came to the hospital where I was, because she was on the system, because she was in, in the system because of medical, she was a director of a company 
that was on the mental health teams and things and what's he doing in here? You know, I know this guy. I know him personally. Why is Tracy? He's a lovable character. What, what's happened? And she came to my aid. She started talking to me about God and I didn't want to know him. And she wanted to talk to me about Jesus, peace be upon him. And eventually when I came out of the hospital, people were trying to help me. They realised their mistakes. And um, she said to me, would you like to come to our functions? It's, I goes, no, I don't do church. And she says, no, this is different. And it was evangelical church, you know. And I met some wonderful people. And I, all I knew was at the time, I was going to this kind of church where it was quite wacky and people were like all over the place with the Holy Spirit and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And all I knew was I was, I was feeling better because of the friendships I was making with people because I found it hard to come out of my property. And some days I just... I suffered really bad at the time. The after effects was depression. What led from that was I was going to conventions, events, many uh, Christian events as well, especially, and eventually we, it set me apart so I could then find chat rooms to keep, to keep that, you know, wow, this is really good. And I entered into a Christian chat room, which is probably the biggest Christian chat room in, uh, in the world where I believed I met some people I thought were going to be friends because of all Christians there from all over the world. And uh, a young man came into the chat rooms and um, introduced himself as Yusuf. And he was, when they were talking about Jesus and the Holy Trinity, and even though at the time, even myself, I still didn't believe in the Trinity. I didn't believe Jesus was a God. And I always believed that even as a Christian. And uh, what subsequently happened after that was he started getting abuse, which I was absolutely gobsmacked and really disappointed that people were calling him such things as ragged and packy and all kinds of devil, you know, spawn of Satan and words worse than that. And I had to sort of like, you know, interfere and what are you doing saying this to our fellow brother? Because, you know, this is, this is not the way of God. Because a young man had come in, he was a Muslim boy and was talking about Islam and we became friends. And even though I was adamant, you know, I'm a Christian at the time and we went into our own chat room so we didn't have to get banned and red dotted and all this kind of stuff, muted, you know. And we set up our own chat room uh, called Boomerang Chat, which was really popular. And a lot of people come from other chat sites worldwide. And so what we decided to do then was, you know, keep this chat room going every other night and it became very popular. And over a period of time, I just kept seeing the beauty of Islam until finally, uh, one day when, you know, listening to the recital for the first time, I just found myself in tears. The recital of the Quran, the first time I heard it, oh, mashallah, I just broke down crying and knew that it was the true word of God. It was, there was no, just nothing else could tell me. It just, I knew it, it, it was, you know, God speaking to me through the, you know, for the recital of the Quran. And even though I was in denial for a long time, trying to avoid this um, and say, look, you know, I'm confused. I would battle with people. They were Christians would throw questions at me saying, you've got to believe in the Holy Trinity, Tracy, for you to be a Christian. And Jesus is God. And I found myself saying, you know, well, if he's God, show me a passage in the Bible where he says, I am God, worship me. It clearly doesn't. It doesn't even mention Trinity in the Bible. It doesn't exist. So I looked more into things and I've, I've researched this with Hebrew scholars and people and even Jewish rabbis are admitting that Muhammad's name, peace be upon him, is mentioned in the Book of Solomon, the Song of Solomon, which is in the original Tanaka Bible. And uh, even though they refute that, don't want to talk about it, it's fact. So that also added to my belief that there was something about Islam and this prophet called Muhammad, peace be upon him. The biggest over the period of time through my illness, as I was a Christian at that time, and I, I started giving up with Christianity, still visiting the chat rooms, but I knew something wasn't right in my heart. And this one particular time, not so long ago, building up to it last year, without telling me, my then ex-partner and her boyfriend had moved from about a couple of miles away because she knew that I would go crazy. I wouldn't be able to handle my son not being in the same town. And I, I just went off, to, I found out the area, and um, at that time, I, I just saw red ended up going down to this area, to a school that I believe there'd be a nursery, the only one in the area that he could possibly be at. So I'm so angry and it was a, one of the worst days. It was unbelievable and I got so angry with God and started challenging God and swearing at him and uh, wanted to end it all there and then. And um, by the grace of God, you know, as I was swearing at God to give me a sign, a vehicle that meant so much to me in my life because Previously, the seven, eight years ago, 
when I was homeless and they bought the, this vehicle to me, where well, I used it as a fun bus for all the down and outs, was there in front of me. And it was a miracle in itself. It was just amazing. It was like God said, shut up now and put that there. Because that van was supposed to go and got destroyed seven, eight years ago. But to top it all, I was sat there in a van crying and I was shaking on the steering wheel. Sorry, God, you know? And I was just there and I heard a voice just whisper in my ear and it was so gentle and I knew it was a very feminine voice. And I can hear it now, it's incredible. Not as much, but it, it just said to me, Tracy, this I give to you, use it well. And this, I heard this harmony. And I heard these harmonies going through my head and a song. And I can't sing and write and I heard these words and I couldn't, I couldn't adjust to it. And as I don't even remember driving home, it seemed like hours. And then all of a sudden it changed. And when I got home, all I could think about was getting on YouTube to remember the song and, and, that, and, and the rhythm. And where I, I was putting words in thinking, that's where, I thought, hold on a minute, that's not coming in my head. I better change that because it's not Christian-like. That's what I did. And Christian was saying to me, no, you've got to change that. I was like, and then all of a sudden I heard, call upon the help of angels, Muhammad was blessed. Those who reign before him, in heaven he now sets. So we must keep believing that someday they will be coming. And that day is fast approaching when our prophet was blessed. Now people around the world are saying to me, it's a Nasheed. I didn't know what it was. And I'm like, what's that? And they're saying, well, you've had a something, you know? And uh, that just told me it was a miracle. It was a sign from God. And that period of that time, of that month, you know, a friend of mine was on a live stream online around the world. And I, uh, I don't know if I can mention the company, but they were like a, you know, a British Muslim Islamic group. Uh, and my friend was on their live stream and I was just posting in Facebook messages about him and what a wonderful guy he is. And the next thing you know, I'm on the show and I didn't see this coming ever. And I just embraced Islam and took my Shahada. Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is everything to me. You know, he's the living God, he's the beneficent, he's the merciful, he's the creator of all things. If you think about nothing and say, well, the world came from a big bang, it came from space, well, nothing can come from nothing. It's quite simple. God is God, but he's Allah. And he's, he, he is the power. He's everything that drives the birds to sing to him in the morning, in the early hours of dawn. And there's only one God. And it's passion to me. It's love to me, it's peace and his word is, is, is Islam. And Allah is, is, is my God, he's your God, he's everybody's God. He's the same living God, the one true living God. And whichever way you look at it, you know, whatever religion, there's only one God and it's Allah. And Islam means the world to me. There's, there's nothing you know, in comparison. It's God, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's the true story of all our prophets, peace be upon them all. You know, the beginning of time, the beginning before the beginning. You know, further than the galaxy itself, you know, and I hear so many different theories how the galaxy was made and scientists try and give their reason, but then how can you make something out of nothing? You can't make something out of nothing. And that's why Allah exists and he's real. And uh, he's speaking to us now through the world. The true representation of Islam is peace. And I would recommend anybody to look into it, you know, to, to research it more pick up the Quran, it's the true word of God.